start recording. All right. Hello, everybody. This is Carrie McLaughlin. I am South Atlantic Council staff. And I'm going to go ahead and get started. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. And um, so I wanted to let everybody know how, how this is going to work. I am going to do an overview of the amendment, Coastal Migratory Pelagics Amendment 30. Uh, when I'm finished with that, we can do um, a question and answer with me. And um, to do that, you have a little hand icon on your um, on your webinar box there, and you hit that, and I will be able to see it. And then I will unmute you and let you know um, that you are unmuted, and you may have yourself muted or unmuted. So, uh, but we'll be able to tell. But for now, I have everyone muted, and uh, we'll let you speak and ask questions and I'll answer. There's also um, a little box uh, where you can type in questions to me and I can see those and um, I can read those out loud um, if you just want to type your question in there when we're doing the question and answer. Then we go, are going to um, start the public comment part. So at that point we'll say okay we're going to take public comment and um, that is the only part of this webinar that will be transcribed. All of the webinar is being recorded and there will be an audio file available if anybody needs it. But as far as being transcribed and included in the official public record, it will only be that public comment portion of this. And so I'll let you know and then we'll do the same thing. You raise your hand if you want to make a public comment on the record. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with the presentation. So a little background on the federal fisheries regulatory process starting down here at the bottom. Um, this is all the input that goes into the process from council staff from our stock assessments through the CDAR process, the scientific and statistical committee, these are the scientific advisors to the council, and our advisory panels and public input. And all of that um, information goes to the council. They get that information from the scientists, the fishing stakeholders, and they develop fishery management plans and amendments to those plans. So the Coastal Migratory Pelagics Fishery Management Plan is a joint plan with the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council, and this is a joint amendment to that plan. After the councils have approved the plan um, or, and the amendment, <clears throat> or the amendment, it goes to the National Marine Fisheries Service, which we call NIMS, and the Secretary of Commerce, and they review the amendments um, and the recommendations from the councils, and they implement those as federal fishing regulations. So a little background on CMP Amendment 30. <clears throat> so in two, 2015, the recreational landings for Atlantic Kobe exceeded the recreational annual catch limit, which we call the ACL, and that resulted in a reduced 2016 recreational season because that, that was the accountability measure for Atlantic Kobe. <clears throat> and this, this um, the recreational season for federal waters closed on June 20th, 2016. And this resulted in negative social and economic impacts on recreational fishermen who target Kobe especially in North Carolina and Virginia, because usually they are target, targeting cobia um, later in the summer, in July and August. So in September 2016, the South Atlantic Council approved Framework Amendment 4, which probably you guys um, had been involved with and also provided your public comment on, and that included actions to change the recreational harvest limits to one per person and six per vessel with a 36-inch fork leaf fork length minimum size limit. It, there was also an action in Framework Amendment 4 to change the recreational fishing year. So, um, however, we couldn't do that in a Framework Amendment. So the South Atlantic Council moved it into this amendment, Amendment 30. So it's a joint uh, fishery management plan and a joint amendment. So the Gulf of Mexico Council actually reviewed it last week. Um, they selected the same preferred alternative as the South Atlantic, and they approved it 
for formal review. So in combination with the proposed harvest limits from the Framework Amendment 4, um, the council is intending that these changing this recreational fishing year will also reduce the risk of exceeding that annual catch limit before participants in all states have had the opportunity to fish for cobia. <clears throat> so here's the process in August. Um, we had public hearings for Framework Amendment 4, and we also included this at that action to change the fishing year, even though it was in its old amendment. Um, in September, the South Atlantic Council approved that framework, and then they moved this action into Amendment 30. Uh, the Gulf Council last week reviewed it and uh, um, approved Amendment 30 for formal review, and we're also having our public hearing webinar and our public comment period. And in December 2016, at their meeting in Atlantic Beach, North Carolina, the South Atlantic Council is going to review this public input, and they're going to approve for formal review by the Secretary of Commerce. And then the changes um, we expect to be implemented in spring or summer of 2017. So the areas that would be affected by this action and the amendment it would apply to recreational harvest of Atlantic cobia in federal waters from Georgia through New York, which is called the Atlantic Group of Cobia. The boundary between the Gulf Group and Atlantic Group is at the Georgia-Florida line, and this was based on the approach used in the most recent stock assessment, and it was implemented in 2015 through CMP Amendment 20B. So there's just one action in here to modify the recreational fishing year. Um, so a fishing, the fishing year is when the um, quota kind of resets each year. And so um, the current fishing year is starts January 1st through December 31st. The South Atlantic and now Gulf Council preferred alternative two is to change that fishing year to start May 1st through April 30th. Alternative three means it would start June 1st through May 31st. And alternative four, it would start April 1st through March 31st. So the councils uh, were provided information about how landings peak throughout the year for uh, the recreational landings for Atlantic Cobia. So they start to increase in that second wave, uh, March and April. And then they peak May, June, and July and August. And around September or October, they... Um, most of the landings have, have finished and everybody um, is no longer fishing for cobia in general. That's what the pattern looks like. So what we did uh, was we took those recommended bag limit, vessel limit, and minimum size limit that the council just approved in Framework Amendment 4 and, uh, and applied those based on what it would look like under each of these potential fishing years. And uh, we use the landings data from 2013 through 2015. And this, what this indicates is what it would look like if, the, if it was a period of um, high landings for Cobia. <clears throat> and so what the dates are, are the estimated dates when the recreational landings would reach that recreational annual catch limit. So if it was a period of high landings and high, um, the high landings coming for recreational recreational landings for Atlantic Cobia, we would expect under the current fishing year would be mid-July. Mid um, we have a, a range because it kind of depends on how many people are on each boat. So um, if there are less than six people, then they're going to be restrained by that bag limit. Um, if there are more than six people, they're going to be restrained by that vessel limit. So uh, the way the analysis works is it's kind of a range. So under the current fishing year, uh, the landings would reach the ACL mid-July. Um, under the South Atlantic and Gulf Preferred, it would be about the same around mid-July. Under June 1st, um, it would be May 5th, and that would actually be of the next calendar year. And under April, um, if it started in April, it would be July also. So this kind of can show you how high the landings are in June. We also did another analysis and we used landings data from 2005 through 2014. And we had received some public input that indicated they felt like the 2015 landings were so high, they didn't really capture the more normal uh, variation in the average landings that the fishery had seen in the past 10 years. 
So we also looked at that, and that gives you a little more of an idea of how the bag limit, minimum size limit, vessel limit, and fishing year would work with a more um, average landings. So under the alternative one, the current fishing year, January 1st, it would last um, through October, first or second week in October. For the preferred alternative, May 1st, it would last somewhere between the end of October into the following March, depending on um, how many people were in the boat. June, June 1st, uh, the alternative three, June 1st, it would last through about the end of May of that following fishing year. And then alternative four, starting on April 1st, it would last from somewhere in October or maybe even into February of the next year. So that's all I have in the presentation. Um, you can, if you want, to submit your comments, written comments via our online form. You can go to our webpage. You can also mail comments in. We have the mailing address. We'll get those um, scanned and provided to the council members and included in the public comment or in the public record. And the deadlines for comments to be included in the comment overview for the December 26th council meeting is November 15th. Anything you send us, though, even if it's after that date, we will always pass along to the council members and provide to the public and then also include in the public record. We just have that deadline for kind of our comment overview for our briefing book materials. And if you have any questions about COBIA and Amendment 30, my name is Carrie McLaughlin. I am the staff lead for um, COBIA and Coastal Migratory Pelagics. You can call me here at the office or send me an email. My information is on our website also. And if you have any general questions about the council or getting involved, you can get in touch with Amber, our fishery outreach specialist, our Kim, our public information officer. We have their information there and on our website. I have a couple additional info slides in case some questions came up um, in here. These are the, the recreational landings by state. Um, that we provided <clears throat> an additional slide that showed um, how the landings peaked in each state through wave two, which is March and April through the end of the year. A little more additional background about Atlantic Cobia recreational management and accountability measures, and a little information about framework amendment and plan amendment and our process for that. So all of that, um, this presentation in a PDF form and a YouTube recording, um, those are available on our website. <clears throat> so you can go back and take a look at those if you need to, but I have them on here in case we have questions. Okay, so I'm going to open it up for questions. You can either raise your hand or, um, or you can type in a question and I'll read it out loud. Thank you, Mitchell. I'm glad you can hear. Okay, Bill, Gorham, I have you unmuted. Do you have a question? I think you have yourself muted. How about now? Yes, we can hear you now. All right. I was hoping somebody else was going to ask a question first. But um, I'm not sure if y'all reviewed the um, catch totals that have come in for Wave 4. I believe they're under review now as well. Um, but if they hold true, uh, what, is it, what is the South Atlantic's thoughts? Um, because I think it, you know, looking at all the assessments, and I, I don't know what to think. Um, overall, because with the catch tolls coming in from Virginia so high, even North Carolina so high, again, with the strictest regulations in history, um, it seems like the fishery would be shut down repeatedly and early. Um, was just trying to kind of pick y'all's brain and see if you had any comments on that, comments or thoughts. 
Well, we just received the information and the preliminary landings. And for other folks on here, um, the the wave four, uh, which is July and August, uh, MRIP estimates for Atlanta Cobia came in um, last week and were available. And they are preliminary. <clears throat> um, but they also don't include any headboat um, landings for the South Atlantic states anyway. And they um, are indicating that recreational landings have again exceeded the annual catch limit in 2016. Even though the uh, federal waters closed in, in June and then um, Virginia stayed open until the end of August and North Carolina state waters stayed open until the end of September, but with some more restrictive measures put into place. Um, at this time, I, the, the council will be discussing this and I think uh, at their December meeting, um, and we will get to hear from the National Marine Fishery Service about uh, what's next for this. And um, I think that it will really have to wait and see in December when the council is all together and when they review that information, what they want to do next. Um, there is also the Atlantic States uh, Marine Fisheries Commission is also starting development of a complementary fishery management plan. Um, and so that might also contribute to keeping landings under that annual catch limit and or better monitoring reporting for the fishery. All right. Okay, we have, okay, Bill, I muted you. Again, we have um, some questions on the typed questions. So I'm gonna go through those really quickly. Is the division of Atlantic versus Gulf genetically based um, from Mitchell? So that um, the stock boundary was based on um, genetic and tagging information that was used in the last stock assessment. And that is um, CDAR 28, if anybody needs to look at that information. And so it, um, they used this approach um, based on the information that was available. Since then, they have, um, there is more information available, more tagging and other um, studies that have been done that that will be included. And then um, you guys may have heard there is a stock ID workshop that's being planned. In 2017, it'll probably be late summer, early fall, and it includes several species, but one of those is cobia, and they're going to talk about the boundary. Now, however, it will, under the current stock assessment schedule, they are not going to be reviewing that in a way where they would um, the stock assess have a an update our standard stock assessment until 2020 for this one. All right, so then, so yes, the division was based on genetics, um, genetic and tagging. And then another question, with this amendment, was any consideration of climate change in the fish moving further north and sooner? Um, there has been some discussion about that, and that may be something that gets brought into the next stock assessment when they are considering um, the management recommendations for the stock. All right, so I'm going to unmute Mike Avery. He has his hand raised. Mike, I have you unmuted, but I think you're muted yourself. Yeah. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, you can. Okay. Yeah, I'm actually trying to connect via the app because I'm driving on the road now, so I'm hoping you can hear me. But I am being safe because I have my headset on. So uh, I, I have a question on your uh, slide that shows table S2. Uh, if you could bring that up just real quick. Sure. Um, your, your analysis shows the difference between us catching one fish per boat versus catching six fish per boat only shows 
the quota reefs as being two days apart. That really kind of baffles my mind that, that that's how the math came out. I was wondering if you could shed any information on how that analysis was done and how can we only be two days apart on such a big difference in our limits of fish? Well, I think it all, it, I mean, this analysis, um, it is, it's a very complex analysis and there are a lot of assumptions in there. Um, because we don't ever, we will never really know how many people are on a boat that is going fishing and if they max out their vessel, um, their vessel limit or not, that would be in place. Um, I think that when the analyst who was at our Southeast Regional Office looked at this um, and he was looking at triplet limit level data, what this really says that in the summer and especially in the later summer, um, it could be suggesting that at that time is when, when there are boats that have, you know, would hit that vessel limit. And, um, and that's why it's so close. And maybe in other parts of the year, it wouldn't be doing that. It would be a little more maybe um, private vessels or smaller vessels that don't have six people on them. So they're going to be restrained by that one per person. Um, and then, I mean, really with these estimated dates for when the landings would hit the annual catch limit, um, you know, we also, that was incorporated into the, the analysis was that uh, it assumes that state and federal and all the states across the board are going to have the same uh, regulations, which is not the case now. Um, but that was the way that we had to make that assumption um, to get them, to get this model, to get any numbers, you know, to give you guys an idea of how this is going to play out. And then it's also really going to depend on the level of effort and the level of fish available in the right place at the right time. So, um, you know, we did our best. And it's not going to be a perfect science, but we wanted to kind of at least show you relative to each other how it would work. Well, I would encourage the staff there to, when you get in numbers like that, and oh, by the way, your explanation still makes no sense, that when you get in numbers like that that make no sense provided by an analyst, that you go back to the analyst and say, hey, this makes no sense to any of us. Can you either recheck your figures or provide us a rationale as to how you came up with those numbers because they absolutely make no sense. The difference between one fish and six fish is is a big difference and most anglers don't go out with one person on a boat. It's usually two to four uh, and and I would just ask you guys that you know you, you should the staff there should question an analysis like that because they just simply make no sense. Well, they, I mean, we definitely do, but until there is, pro, you know, better reporting coming in from the recreational catch, including private vessels, I don't know if we're ever going to be able to give, you know, really a rock solid estimated date. I mean, for this, that doesn't include a lot of assumptions. I mean, you make valid points. It's just, um, this is very complex, especially not knowing how many people are going out um, because we don't have that type of reporting and monitoring in place. Well, then I wouldn't even put the slide together. If, if, if you don't even know where it came from and you're not confident in any of the data, just don't even bother putting the slide together. That's my only uh, Well, I mean, we are, we are confident in that at least they can show you how, um, how the alternatives are going to interact or, or how they are compared to one another, you know. So under in, in table S2, when we use the landings from 2013 through 2015, what you can see here is that there's not going to be a lot of difference for alternative one and the preferred alternative two and alternative four. And maybe it's not perfect, but you can kind of see fishing year is not going to give, you know, possibly is not going to really change things that much. Um, it's going to be more those harvest limits and minimum size limit. Oh, I'm not talking about when the season starts. I'm talking about your your analysis that shows one boat versus uh, six per boat. That's the difference I'm talking about. And those are only your analysis only shows two days apart. Uh, and, and that's what I'm talking about. I, you know, I get you know when the season starts is what it's minimum's about, but the analysis is what I'm talking about that shows we're only two days apart in when the season when the quota is reached. Okay. Well, this is what we have. So okay. I'm, I'm going to move on to our next um, person raising their hand. 
I'm going to mute you, Mike. Um, let's see. I think Jeff, you were next. Jeff Deem, I'm going to unmute you. If you want to. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. All right. Thanks for the, for the presentation tonight. I wondered, uh, tried to find on your website an easy link to those uh, slides you showed, especially the ones that showed the graphs of the different states. Can you give me uh, some easy directions on where to find those on your website? Yeah. Um, if you go to our website, which is just safmc.net, and um, you go over here to meetings and under the public hearings and scoping meetings, it will bring up this page. Um, these are all on the same page, but um, you can scroll down here. And we have the meeting materials and we have the presentation and a PDF. Um, there's also the full amendment document if you want to look at all of that, a video presentation of me doing what I just did. Uh, okay. All right. All right. Okay. Is that it? That's it. Okay. Appreciate it very much. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. All right. I think Wes. Um, I'm unmuted. You met Wes. Hey, Carrie. Um, could you go back to that S2 slide? Let's see. Yes. Here we go. All right, so what my question is, um, take alternative two. That says a one person and a 36 inch fork length minimum size, the closure date would be July 18th? No, okay, so let me um, clarify here. These are not closure dates. These are the estimated dates when landings would hit the annual catch limit. Um, okay, the ACP. Um, yeah, and so what happens at that point depends on your accountability measures. You know, the council is recommending um, that first a reduced vessel limit would be applied. If that was not enough, then you would reduce the season length. So at this okay. time, I, I just want everybody to know these are not the estimated closure dates. Um, it's just more also to show you how uh, when we did the analysis, how the different bag limit and vessel limits would slow the rate of harvest. So, okay. So, all right. Yeah. So that's assuming that the season starts on May 1st, then it would close or you would reach that target of ACT on July 18th of that year. That is what so, they, yeah, the analysis showed with the bag limit, vessel limit, and new minimum size limit. Okay. And then an alternative three. If the year started on June 1, then the ACT would be met on May 5th of the following year. Is that correct? Yes. So we would have fishing from June 1 all the way through May 5th. Po possibly. That is what this analysis shows, the estimated date. And then all the other alternatives only gives fishing from like alternative two from May 1 until Ju July 18th of that same year. Yes. So why wouldn't alternative three be y'all's choice? Well, um, first of all, so S S2 uses landings data from 2013 through 2015. So this is also, um, you know, a period of high landings. Now they put, we're putting into place new regulations. The states have put in new regulations. And so it's possible that this table that uses, the analysis uses um, 05 through 2014 data maybe would be more accurate, in which case they would at least make it through October for all of these. But with a May 1st start date, it is guaranteed that it will be open May 1st every year. And we have a council member, Zach Bowen, who is on um, on the webinar. And so I'm going to unmute him and let him speak because he can also give you some rationale as a council member. 
Okay, Zach, you are unmuted. Thanks, Carrie. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody and thank you too for being on the webinar tonight. Um, this is some very, very important um, information we're going over. But to answer that last gentleman's question about uh, May 1st versus June 1st, um, and, and I can definitely speak for, for Georgia because I'm, I'm a resident here and a fisherman of here, and, I, and I'll speak for South Carolina as well. Um, the, the fish show up on, on our coast um, earlier than June 1st, and, and that's um, something that, that the Georgia and South Carolina constituents are, and council members and, and recreational anglers are also thinking about. Um, and, and I, that, that's my rationale for um, the May 1st start date. And the other thing I wanted to mention of Mike Avery's comment, I'm, I, was, I had it on my mind a while ago when he was talking and then <laughs> we swapped, but um, so I'm, I'm going to, unless Mike wants to come back, if he's still listening and, and oh, he was asking, he was asking about why only the short differences between one per person versus six per boat. Um, the rationale behind that or the reasoning behind the, the short differences of the uh, projected ACL um, dates that the, the dates the, the, clo the closeness of, of the dates that the ACA, ACL will be met if you look at that that just tells tells me and, and any should tell anybody else that that the majority of the boats are not catching their limit and he would I don't know where he based his analysis on about two to four persons per vessel that may be true except in the four hire fleet and then we you know definitely have more people on the on the vessel but the the small differences between the projected ACL dates are because the majority of the anglers are not reaching their limit so I that's the two things I really wanted to get across unless something comes up um, or if somebody has a question for me but um, I just felt obligated to to, re to respond to, to those concerns and, and I appreciate you letting me speak thank you all right thanks Zach all right Bill Gorham I think that you have another question and I have you unmuted I had to unmute myself. Yes, we can hear you. Um, it, it's a question kind of comment in reference to the June. Oh, I think you muted yourself again, Bill. There you go. How about now? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, with the June 1st date, Looking at the catch totals, um, at least our analysis, and I think everybody else's, it's the season won't last till the following May. Um, so it will be closed down more than likely for the month of May, which is Hatter's, North Carolina's you know, peak season. Um, and I know that we gave public comment on why May 1st had to be the start date. Um, I believe others to the south agreed that if we do a June first start date, um, we run a very, very big risk of losing our peak season in North Carolina as well. Um, and referencing Captain Avery, um, it, you can kind of tell his frustration and just kind of a comment, but not official public comment. Um, that's what I'm dealing with a lot here with a lot of the charter and recreational fishermen. Um, they just they, they don't understand it. The catch total, the regulations with the catch total results, and then what it's going to do to future seasons. And uh, it, it's I know this is about start dates, um, but with the catch totals coming in, it seems to have just really really stirred the pot with everything so it's like what what what's the best thing to do um that's all i have i'll mute myself okay thank you okay wes you have another another question 
Yeah, more of a comment. Um, you know, the June 1 start date, it gives Virginia the advantage. Uh, you know, by, by starting it in April or May, you know, you allow the states to the south of Virginia to catch all the fish, and Virginia will never have a season again. The problem is that this fish, a migratory fish, you're regulating it by not having some type of allocation system, and it will never work. The northern states will never get a fair share of time to fish for this fish if you do not have some type of allocation system. And as, as temperatures warm, the states more to our north, you know, Maryland. Maryland had caught a lot of fish this year. So you're going to, by not having an allocation system and having that season open later, you're never going to allow those states that y'all are regulating north of North Carolina to ever have access to this fish. So, Wes, I do want to be sure that you are going to, you know, either send in some written comments that capture that or when we start our public comment portion of this that's going to be transcribed and included that you you make those comments as well because this part is still the Q&A part. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm going to move on. Jeff has another question. Jeff, I have you unmuted. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Is it not possible to have what we call in the energy business a sliding window for this uh, seasonal thing where that each region has a sliding period uh, where proportion, an equal portion is taken out of each region's uh, season so that everyone gives up an equal amount of their season? Um, do you get what I'm getting at? Yes, I think um, kind of where different parts of the region are, is open. Kind of right. Similar. Everybody's okay. season, peak season is cut by the same amount. Right. And um, the council has discussed this. Our Virginia, we do, we do have a representative from Virginia, um, from the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council, who has a voting seat on our coast, our mackerel cobia committee for the South Atlantic Council. And he has brought that up um, and we've, you know, had some people talk about it. I think that would be a good comment if you want to um, do a public comment on the record for the council to look into something like that. Um, it's something that the council could consider along with what Wes was talking about, like some kind of allocation at the state or you know, in different parts um, so that everybody had a certain, you know, either time period or poundage that they were, they had access to. Um, and as of now, the council doesn't really do anything like that, um, except maybe with King Mackerel. But they, you know, that may be something if the public is interested, the council may want to consider. So I think that would be a great comment to pass along, either written or when we get started on our public comment portion. All right, I'll write it in. Thank you. Thank you. All right, it looks like we've answered all the questions. We don't have any more written questions. So as of now, I'm going to officially um, open it up and this part is the part that's gonna be transcribed, included in the public record as public comment. Uh, if you would like to speak on the record, you can raise your hand and I will call your name and unmute you. Okay. All right. Mike Avery? Okay. Uh, yeah, this is Mike. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, so I'm uh, uh, Mike Avery. I'm the uh, current president of the Virginia Saltwater Sport Fishing Association, and so we network with a, a lot of anglers throughout the state, uh, and I'm also a, a, a charter captain uh, in Virginia that also fishes uh, for cobia. Uh, I have a couple of comments I want to make uh, 
uh, verbally uh, a little bit, uh, not necessarily on this particular amendment, but I want to get them on the record. Uh, and then I'll make a comment on this amendment. And we will be providing uh, later written comments, uh, but for now this is just the verbal comments. So we are uh, aware uh, of a procedure that the National Marine Fishery Services has uh, called emergency rules. Uh, and, and they're established and there's criteria out there. Uh, and I want to read uh, the criteria uh, for an emergency rule. It says uh, an emergency rule uh, can be uh, defined as results from recent unforeseen events or recently discovered circumstances and present serious conservation or management problems in the fishery and can be addressed through emergency regulations for which the immediate benefits outweigh the value of advance notice, public comment, and deliberative consideration of the impacts on participation to the same extent as would expect it under normal rulemaking processes. And so where I'm going with this is we would like to see a motion made within the council at the next meeting uh, that an emergency rule be considered to to redo the zone split that was done during the last stock assessment. That is the crux of our problem and that's why we are faced with what we call uh, an artificial notion of overfishing. When you split the zone and you gave Georgia through the through New York a very small quota as compared to even the the, the Atlantic coast of Florida. You, you created a situation where we're going to lose lose. We're always going to be in this overfishing situation, at least an artificial overfishing situation. Whereas if you look at the numbers overall for the true Atlantic coast from Key West to New York. We're really not overfishing. So our overfishing situation is artificially created by the council, and we believe that an emergency rule should be it go in place to, to fix this injustice done uh, in, in the stock assessment, and we should not have accepted uh, blindly what the SSC came up with for this zone split. I think it was not done correctly. I think when it came up, you know, the council could have questioned the SSC and not just shrug their shoulders and say, well, that's what they came up with, so that's what we're going to accept. I think from this day forward, until a new stock assessment is done, we're going to always be in this artificial overfishing notion that, oh, we've overfished, we have to shorten the season, and we have to reduce bag limits. And I don't think we're there yet. I think that uh, we need to address this through an emergency rule. So that's, that'll be part of our comments we make is we think that we need to have an emergency rule uh, put in place. And those procedures do exist and they can be done, they started at the South Atlantic if a motion is made. Uh, so I just want to make that recommendation to the council as, as the first comment. The second comment, I just want to uh, additionally go on record, we've said this before, is that we're opposed to co-management uh, with the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission uh, until a new stock assessment is done. It really makes no sense to us to enter into a co-management and just adding another layer of complexity to our to manage a very small quota among the states. We don't think there's any advantage to that, so we're opposed to that until we have either the stock assessment corrected through an emergency rule or a new stock assessment done, and then I think we should consider it, but not until then. So I just want to say those two points out. Uh, now, on, on this amendment, uh, this is now you've kind of complicated things in my mind about what our position should be. I would say to you, our position is, is if your analysis cor is correct uh, in the tables, table S2, if your analysis is correct, uh, that if we start the season on 1 June, then we get almost a full year of fishing, which I don't really believe that's true. But if that analysis is correct, and we can fish all the way to almost the end of May, and everybody still gets almost a full year of fishing, then we support uh, uh, starting the season on 1 June. Uh, having said that, if the analysis is incorrect and, our, and we believe that we're always going to overfish and achieve our targets and ACL early, 
then we really, to be fair to the other states, we really think one May is the, is the correct choice because we don't want to, our, our concern is if we really start on 1 June uh, and, and we reach our quota before the end of summer, uh, then we've really screwed our southern neighbors from Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina who now can't fish in the spring uh, until the following 1 June. And so, uh, so what I'm saying, I, I know I'm, I'm kind of being wishy-washy, but the analysis seems to support uh, 1 June. And so what I'm saying is if the analysis is correct or reasonably correct, we support 1 June. Uh, if, if the analysis is as we think it probably should be, uh, we, would, we would revert to uh, 1 May. So I'm just throwing it out there. It's kind of wishy-washy, I know, but uh, that's kind of where we stand for now. Uh, and that, that's all I have. Okay. Thank you, Mike. All right, Jeff, I have you unmuted. Okay, for the record, I, I uh, would like to disagree with my friend Mike. Um, I think that you should turn the entire thing over to the ASMFC and, and let them handle this on a state-by-state -state basis with uh, conservation equivalency give an allocation to each state, let them handle it in the season that is best for their particular fishery. Um, let them schedule it when it's best for their fishermen, their allocation, and uh, let them set the regulations that allow them to, to divide up that allocation as works best for them. That's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. All right. And then we have Bill Gorham. I have you unmuted. Bill, I have you unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Bill Gorham, lure manufacturer from North Carolina representing Charter Captain's Recreational for Hire, um, which is actually Charter Captain's too, um, and Associated Businesses um, in Northeastern North Carolina and some of Virginia. Um, we actually agree with Mr. Avery, um, Captain Avery, um, given all of the circumstances that we've brought to light through the South Atlantic, um, through our review of CDAR 28, and state-by-state -state research of Cobia, um, it is overwhelmingly clear that Amendment 18 and 20B um, seem to be geared towards um, spawning aggregations in state waters. Um, and the federal regulations are supposed to be in federal waters, which actually supported a population that was one and the same and even looking at tagging results, um, it's known that the same fish that go to these spawning aggregations in quote unquote spawning months also travel into Florida waters um, during the winter. So from a conservation standpoint, if we're trying to protect the same fish that are going to the same areas in spawning, we need to be protecting them in federal waters. And federal regulations should reflect what the science says in federal waters. Um, and ultimately for the emergency action, I know a rule, I know I've gone back and forth with this from our state representatives, obviously coming from just me or a group of us is one thing, um, but I really hope, really hope um, the council looks at it. Um, I'll be giving detailed reasons why at the next South Atlantic meeting I believe several of the criteria is met, met you know from looking at new science to pitting states against each other um, and ultimately creating unfair access to the fishery. Um, just real quick on the Atlantic states allocation um, I think again if we were at 2014 ACL we could probably all live with some form of allocation, but for North Carolina, 
you have your boat season, then you have your pier season. Um, and looking at catch rates, say for even Virginia, and using the same methodology um, that's coming up with our season lengths, you're looking at two and a half week season. You know, what conservation equivalent could you come up with when you're being predicted to catch you know, 250,000 pounds every two weeks? Um, if that's what you want, that's what you get. Atlantic states, we are also against Atlantic states taking any further action given our ACL because they have no authority or no power to adjust, raise, lower the ACL, which everything is dependent upon. So the season lengths um, that we fear we would end up with with Atlantic States allocation or Atlantic States joint management um, would be detrimental. Um, on behalf of the stakeholders and hatters, um, I'm not sure if many of the people in the council are even around, but there, this past hurricane, there's several of our charter captains that don't have a home. Um, they're completely flooded out. Um, their boats were lost. Um, it's going to take them all winter to get back, and Cobia is their fishery that month of May. That's how they're going to rebound. Um, if we don't have it, especially this May, it's going to hurt. Uh, and our regulations are the regulations of less than one per person, up to six per boat, really did hurt them um, this past year. But we do support, or at least we must have our fishing year for Cobia start May 1, and for the piers, it must go through the end of August. How we get there is, I guess, up to the councils and signs. But that is all. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. OK, um, does anybody? Oh, Wes. OK, Wes, I have you unmuted. Hi, um, Wes Blow, um, recreational fisherman from Virginia. Um, I, as far as a closure date, not closure dates, but the, the seizing um, changing, um, I don't see how that really will benefit uh, any of the states. Uh, to pick the June 1 would, would greatly benefit Virginia and, and be a big disadvantage to the southern states, which is a situation that Virginia is in now <laughs> with no state-by-state uh, -state allocation system. So I firmly believe that the only fair and equitable way to manage a migratory fish is to have some type of state-by-state -state allocation system for it. I, I do encourage the co-management with ASFMC. I believe that will be very good in the long run so that each state can apply their regulations um, that would help you know, them to catch the most fish for their fair share. Uh, another thing that I would like to make a, a note of is Virginia last year during the season they kept their state waters open went to a two boat a two fish per boat limit and obviously with the numbers that came out uh, people were capable of catching plenty of fish so you know the, the three four five and six boat limits uh, I don't I don't see where that's necessary uh, another issue that I'd like the South Atlantic Council to consider is the quality of fish that are available now. And if you look at the citations and the larger fish that Virginia has been catching over the last 10 years, we have not had a over 100 pound fish since 2011. Uh, and in the 90 pound class fishes, we've only had a few. And this year, we had none. 
So last year, Virginia enacted their rules with the two fish limit per boat, only one of them being over 50 inches. I don't know what the records are for the southern states to us, but in Virginia, the quality fish, there's, there's plenty of fish out there, but the bigger fish are being killed off. And if the South Atlantic Council doesn't take measures to protect these large fish, um, I think it's a big injustice to the whole, whole seaboard uh, that won't have that, that quality of fish. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. All right, has anybody, does anybody else want to give um, public comment? You can go to our webpage, go to the public hearing page and um, scroll down about writing and there you can submit a comment here. It takes you to a form. Uh, you write in your information and then just add your text here. Um, you type your comment here. If you have something that has graphs, figures, letterheads, you can email it to our office manager, Mike Collins. Um, but in general, you can just submit them. And then you can also take a look at um, public comments that we've already received and that will be passed along to the council. All right, if that's it, uh, we're gonna sign off for tonight. Thank you very much for everyone who joined us. Um, if you have any questions, you can Contact me, Carrie McLaughlin. You can call the office or send me an email. And um, otherwise, just let us know if you need any more info. Thanks a lot to everybody.